Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radio detectives. A reminder, great detectives of old time radio t-shirts continue to be on sale. Go to t-shirt.greatdetectives.net to place your order and receive your t-shirt before Christmas. Go to t-shirt.greatdetectives.net and you should get that before Christmas if you're in the United States. Now, it won't reach you if you're overseas, but if you do order from overseas, uh, there is a flat rate for international shipping of $3. Uh, so just head on over to t-shirt.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it's time for today's episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. The original air date, April the 15th, 1962. And this one is The Wrong Idea Matter. Johnny Dollar. I don't think you're going to like this, Johnny. No? No, sir. Oh, it can't be that bad. Can't, huh? What you don't know won't hurt you, they always say. Oh, they do. And since I don't know what you're talking about or even who you are... Huh? Oh, sorry. I kind of got ahead of myself. A little ahead of me, too. This is Tim Harrington, Johnny. Down in Knoxville, Tennessee? Yes, sir. Eternity Mutual Insurance Company. Well, how are you, Tim? What's this I'm supposed to start losing sleep over? Alpheus Brannigan. Brannigan? Now, don't tell me you've forgotten him. Oh, wait a minute. At least I hope you haven't. That hot-headed young kid who got five to seven for embezzlement a while back. That's right. About three years ago. You yourself ran him down for us. Sure, I remember now. On a tip you got from that pretty young wife of his. Yes, Mary, uh, Marilyn was her name. Nice girl and pretty, too. And do you remember what Alpha had to say when the judge tossed that sentence at him? Oh, the usual yak about getting even, wasn't it? That sort of thing? Getting even not only with you, Johnny, but with her. And that poor kid has been worried about the day he'd get out ever since the day he went in. Well, he still has a couple of years to go, hasn't he? So what's the big rush? He has not. What? Alpha Brannigan got out of the pen a couple weeks ago. No kidding. Made a break? A smart kid like that? No, sir. He just made like an angel for a while, and they gave him all that time off for so-called good behavior. You ask me, Johnny, they were suckers. Because if you really remember that boy... Yeah, I, um, I see what you mean. And his wife is a client of ours. You mean he's already got to her? I don't know. Well, somebody better contact her and find out. That's why I'm calling you, Johnny. What do you mean? Haven't you been in touch with her? No, we can't find her. But if he does get to her before you do, I... Say no more, Timmy. I'm on my way. CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Eternity Mutual Insurance Company, Knoxville, Tennessee office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the wrong idea matter. <laughs> Expense account item one. Six dollars for a cab to the airport and fifty-eight thirty-six for a plane ticket. Four and a half hours later, we sat down at McGee Tyson Airport some 12 miles southeast of Knoxville. So, item two is $1.35 for limousine service that dropped me off at Tim Harrington's front door. Hi, Johnny. Glad you could make it. Hi, Tim. Sit down. Sit down. I'll get right to this. All right. Now, Tim, let's get one thing straight. I know. I know, Johnny. Marilyn Brannigan's policy has a face value of only $7,500. And on account of what happened with her husband, she's named her brother Charlie over in Memphis, beneficiary. Well, that isn't what I was about. But a client's a client, and we got to protect her if we aren't too late. Too late for what? For what? Johnny. Now, listen, Tim. When you've heard as many of those wild courtroom threats as I have, well, after a while, you just don't pay too much attention to them anymore. Well, I do. I was right there in that courtroom. So was I. I not only heard what Alfred Brannigan said, but I saw the way that he said it. He was just a hot-headed kid. You know that, Tim. I can see it in my mind's eye right now. After the judge hit him with that sentence, he turned around real slow. And with a look on his face like I've never seen before. It was cold as ice, Johnny. I, 
like a snake. That body in the courtroom made a sound. Tim. He looked across at that brand new little wife of his, Marilyn. She was sitting there in the front row with her head down. He just stared at her until she looked up at him. I know, Tim. And then without moving a muscle, except in his mouth, he said... Now look, Tim. He said, just remember one thing, Marilyn. One of these days, I'm going to get out again. And when I do, he said, you'll see. Well, okay, but... Then he turned over to where you sat. And that goes for you too, Dollar. For you too, he said. Just a red-headed, hot-headed, excitable kid. Not when he said that, he wasn't. He was cold as ice, Johnny. He wasn't kidding. All right, Tim. So what? The first time she paid him a visit there at the pen, he told her he was sorry. No, sir. He tried to be a good boy. He said somehow make up for what he'd done. No, it sir. always happened. No, sir. You're wrong, Johnny. 100% wrong. Am I? Because in all that time up there, she never saw him once. Not once? Not once. And you know why? Why? Because he wouldn't let her. Because he wouldn't see her. Wouldn't have anything to do with her. No letters, no nothing. And that's why in all these last couple of years, when I've talked to her, she's been just plain worried sick. And a couple of weeks ago, when he got out, well, that's when she called me up and asked me what she ought to do. You mean that she still hadn't heard anything from him? Even when he got out? Not a word. Well, what'd you tell her, Tim? To notify the police. Mm-hmm. And I notified him, too. And then late yesterday, I got this call from Sergeant Piper. Yeah? And he tells me that she's suddenly gone, disappeared, to parts unknown. Has there been any sign of him around? No, sir. And don't you worry. If he had been around, Sergeant Piper and his boys would have known it. Are you sure of that? Well, they were gunning for Alfred Brannigan like nobody they ever gunned for before. But she got away without their knowing how or where. Well, yes. But, Johnny, you've got to find that girl and keep her alive. Well, look, Tim. Yes? Yes, Johnny? Well, I'll do the best I can. Good. And, uh, Johnny. Yeah? Now, just you remember one thing. What's that? You better look out for yourself, too. Oh, sure. Winston Burdett in Rome. Arthur Godfrey in New York, Miami, Las Vegas, or who knows where next. Alexander Kendrick in London. Bing Crosby and Rosemary Clooney in Hollywood. The Philharmonic in New York. These are some of the exclusive sounds of CBS Radio. From all over the country, all over the world, news, music, and entertainment is brought to your homes by experts to create the most unique, interesting, and exciting sound in radio today, the sound of CBS Radio. Heard only at this spot on your radio dial. I walked over to the precinct headquarters where Tim said I could find Sergeant Seymour Jefferson Piper. Unlike any police officer I dealt with in the past there in Knoxville, Piper was a big, lazy, florid man of about 50 and 220 pounds who sat with his feet on the desk chewing a stale, unlighted cigar. Oh, uh, sure, Miss Dollar. I'm completely in charge of that Brannigan thing. And, um... You have found no trace at all of the girl? Now, I know, Miss Dollar, I know exactly what you're thinking. But just because she got out of town without our knowing it don't mean that he could have gotten himself in without our knowing it. And I wondered. Well, I don't. I don't wonder at all. I'm sure of it. Mm -hmm. Not a single lead on her, huh? Well, you see, she had her own car. She was a kind of accountant, you know, for one of the big markets. And doing pretty good for herself. Had her own car. You know the license number of that car? Well, sure. It's U double L one six six. Did you put out an APB right away all over the set? Well, no, sir. Why not? Well, she ain't guilty of any crime, Miss Dollar. I mean, like he was once. What's the matter with you, Sergeant? Isn't it just as important to find her and protect her as it is to run her down if she's done something wrong? Well, yes, sir. Well, of course it is. And we did try to protect her as long as she was around here. Well, Sergeant... But when, uh, when he didn't even show up, and after all that time, two whole weeks, Miss Dollar... Well, don't you, you know why? Because he was probably smart enough to realize that she'd have some kind of protection for a while. He may not be any mental giant, but he isn't any dumbbell either. Well, I know. But I have a clear feel he'd wait until people stopped worrying about him. 
until they get tired of waiting for him and ease up. And that's exactly what you did, Sergeant. Ease up. Get lackadaisical. I'll just hold on there a minute. Well, isn't that why she was able to leave him right under your nose? Well, and you know what else I think? Now, you look here. One of you two were... things. Either she realized your watching over her was getting more casual, more slipshod, and she'd have to look out for herself. Oh, now, miss. Or else, you... Sergeant, and I'm afraid it's a lot more probable, Alfie Brannigan did get through to her and hauled her away. But if he's got to her, sir, well, don't you remember what he said there in court? Did you forget it? Up till just now? Well, of course not. Well, why haven't you done something about her disappearance? Well, I told you, sir. You haven't told, told me anything that makes any sense. Let me have the telephone. Now, just a minute. What are you fixing to do? Well, first I'm going to call the state police. And if they can't find her somewhere in the state, I'll call in the FBI. Did you you don't think much of this department, do you? Well, I have to answer that. Let me have the phone. You sure don't know how to ask for cooperation, do you? Listen, Sergeant. Over the years, I've had cooperation from the Knoxville Police Department second to none. By acting up this way? By dealing with members of the force who have a little sense of responsibility beyond that involved in chasing crooks. Now, j- by men who can think beyond what's right under their noses. Uh, by men who... Uh, I'm just wasting my time here. What's the name of your lieutenant? Now, now just, just a minute, sir. Yes, what for? I guess, uh, I guess maybe you're right, sir. I, I mean about an APB. If it isn't too late. So I'll, uh, well, believe me, Miss Dollar, I'll get one out right away. And I'll include in the state police, like you say, as well as all the other big cities in the state. You will? Hmm? Yes, sir. And I, uh, I apologize, Miss Dollar, for... Well, I was wrong, and I'm admitting it, so just give me a chance, sir. If you please. Sergeant? And where do I get in touch with you when I get some word? If you do. Yes, sir. Mr. Dollar? No, I... I'll be staying at the Andrew Johnson. Thank you, sir. And I'll call you, sir. You better. <laughs> that I kicked myself for letting him go ahead again or for having nearly lost my own temper over his obvious mumbling. Instead, I spent item three, 580, smoothing my ruffled feathers with a dinner at the Rapscaller. Then I signed into the Andrew Johnson. But before I could unpack my bags... Johnny Dollar. Uh, this is Sergeant Piper, sir. Oh, yes, Sergeant. Uh, you were sure right, sir. Miss Brannigan's uh, license number did it. You know where she is? 21270 South Peachtree Street. And where's that? Over to Jefferson City. You told the police over there to keep an eye on her, Sergeant? Well, no, I guess it didn't. Oh, brother. What, sir? Item four is $50 deposit on a drive-your-own car. In almost less time than it takes to tell about it, I covered the 29 miles to Jefferson City and, after inquiries at the gas station, went immediately to the address on South Peachtree. In front of the nondescript little rental cottage was her car. And inside, once I'd got inside, was a very young, very pretty, but badly frightened young woman, Marilyn Brannigan. I, uh, I hope you'll forgive me not letting you in right away, Mr. Dollar. But it's so dark and black outside, and I... I'm so... Oh, I don't know what to do. Uh, How did you find me? Well, the point is that if I could find you, uh, so could your husband. I know. I know. And you haven't heard anything from him or of him since he got out of the pen? Don't you see? That's just it. I haven't heard from him since he went into that terrible place. Three years, Mr. Dollar. Three years I've been... Sitting alone at nights, wondering and wondering what he meant by what he said in that courtroom before they took him away. Well, um, isn't it pretty obvious what he meant? If only I knew. If only I really knew. He never says anything without really meaning it, Mr. Dollar. And he never changes his mind once he's made it up. Mm. You know what I mean? Once he says he'll do something, he never changes from it. And if he did mean to threaten me... Well, what else could he have meant? But it wasn't like him. I loved him, and he loved me, Mr. Dollar. I'm sure of it. Even though it was your information that helped me find him and turn him in? I had to do what was right. Even he wouldn't have had it any other way. Well, I wouldn't be too sure of that. And that money he took, that wasn't like him either. But he didn't... 
He didn't realize what he was doing. He only meant to borrow it for a Christmas present for me and... All of us young folks act so foolish, Mr. Dollar. Marilyn. Yes? In spite of what you've just said, you're still afraid of him, aren't you? I don't know. I don't know. We, we knew so little about each other. Well, you married him. We'd only been married a couple of weeks. And we'd only known each other a couple of months before that. Oh, boy. But I had so much confidence in him. I was so sure that if he faced up to this wrong thing he did, we could make a new start together. Mm-hmm. But when he wouldn't see me or answer my letters, and after what he said in that court, oh, if I only knew, Mr. Dollar, if I only really knew, and if he does come here and find me and... Now, listen, Marilyn. Are you staying here in Jefferson City, Mr. Dollar? No, I'm at the Andrew Johnson over in Knoxville. Why? Because if he does come and I'm here alone... Now, you just listen. Yes. Until we find him, until we know what his intentions are, you have got to have some protection. Now, if things had been handled properly, one of the local police would be here right now. But since he isn't, uh, where's your phone? Oh, I haven't any here. The nearest one is at the filling station two blocks down. Oh. All right. I'm going over there and call the police. And meantime, if I were you, I would keep this door closed and locked. Yes, I will. And Mr. Dollar? Yeah. When you do find him... At least find out before you do anything to him or hurt him. Oh, sure. Don't worry about it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, now, that's the first kiss I've had since, uh... I'm sorry. I guess I shouldn't have. But you're the first one that... Sure, sure. That's okay. I'll, uh, I'll get everything set up and see you later. Thank you. dark out here. Could use a street lamp or two. And... Just a minute, Mr. Flynn. Alfie. Who are you? Alfie Brannigan. Yeah. That's right. Ah, it's me. Um. <laughs> my rental car. The young policeman was gently slapping me with one hand and with the other shoving a bottle of smelling salts, I guess, under my nose. <laughs> That's it, Mr. Dollar. You have another sniff of this and you'll be just oh, no. fine. Oh, no, thanks. That's, <coughs> That's fine. Whatever you say. Y'all oh. okay now? Oh, well, well I don't know. I, uh... Yes, sir. Somebody yeah. must have hit you pretty hard. You just take it easy for a little bit. No, no. Listen, officer. Yes, sir. Uh, inside there in that house. Sergeant must have been wrong. Nobody in that house, Mr. Dollar. What? Well, you see, Sergeant Piper over to Knoxville, he called me. Yeah? He said that Ms. Marilyn Brannigan... And that he got her. He got to her. You mean Alfie, her husband? That's right. He's been here? Yes. Well, and I'll shoot myself because a car pulled away when I come down the street. Must have been him. And he must have had her in it. All right, now look. Yes, sir? You have a radio in your car? Uh, doggone transmitter blew out when I tried to call in about finding you here all beat up. All right, listen. Oh, here. What? Your wallet with your credentials. It was a lie in there beside you. Oh. Alfie must have taken it out of my pocket when he found out who I was. Oh, thanks, anyway. All right, look, get on back to headquarters, will you? And get on the horn and... Oh, uh, do you have a license number and description of that car? Oh, yes, sir. Good. And go to it and get the word out. I'll either be with Sergeant Piper at his precinct or at the Andrew Johnson Hotel over in Knoxville. Yes, sir. <laughs> was torture. By the time I got back to Knoxville, I was feeling pretty shaky. I dropped in on Sergeant Piper, thanked him for having finally alerted the Jefferson City Police, told him to get on the ball again, and then, just barely able to navigate, got up to my room at the Andrew Johnson. Oh, I guess I left the lights on. Yes, sir, you did. What? And you left the door wide open, too. Alfie. And me, Mr. Dollar. What? All right now, Brannigan. No, no, please, please, sir. I'll let me explain about why we came here. He came back to me, Mr. Dollar, to the cottage. 
Oh, you're telling me. Well, I didn't know. I, I didn't know who you were when you when you came out of the cottage. I, and I'm sorry. You didn't know him? No, I Mr. Dollar. Know. But I, I saw you there in the doorway, and, and well, I, I saw her kiss you, and, and, and I heard you say you'd get everything all set and be back. And, well, after all I'd done for her, and thinking maybe she'd taken up with somebody else while I was gone. But I've explained to him now. After all you've done for her, Alfie? Oh, he's wonderful, Mr. Dollar. He's so wonderful. I knew he was. I knew it all the time. It just had to be that way. Uh, don't, don't you see, sir, it was the least I could do after the way I let her down by taking that money three years ago. Look, uh, what do you say we try and make a little sense around oh, here? Maybe I was wrong not seeing her and not answering her letters, but I had to do it alone. I had to work it out for myself. I had to prove I could be worthy of her all by myself. And he has, Mr. Dollar. Mm -hmm. Alfie. You see, I meant it, sir, uh, what I said back there in court. That, that I'd show her and I'd show you, too. That I could make up for that crazy embezzling? Don't you understand? That's what he meant. And I did it, sir. I, I worked. I studied there in prison every day. I worked to improve myself. And when I got out, so I, I could prove to her I'd done right by her, I went to her brother over in Memphis. My brother Charlie. Mm -hmm. Because he'd always liked me, and I knew he'd help me, and, and without letting on to her until I was ready. <laughs> you see, I knew he'd understand, and he did. And you know what Alfie's done in just these last two weeks? A steady job over there. A decent place for us to live, the way we ought to. And away from all these memories. Now we can start out married all over again, the, the right way. Like I should have made it for us before. It's a whole new start, Mr. Dollar. And a clean start. And it's still only half of what a girl like Marilyn deserves. Isn't it wonderful, Mr. Dollar? <clears throat> well. Yes, Alfie? Sir? Sir? You, um, you want to be sure of uh, keeping it that way? Um, oh, believe me, sir. I, I will keep it that way. All right. Then, um, one thing. Remember to keep that temper of yours in check, huh? Uh, yes, sir. Even when you see your wife kissing another man. I will, sir. I promise. I hope so. And I'm, I'm sorry. I'm really terribly sorry for what I did. Well, that's all right. To have a case end like this for a change, maybe it was worth it. Thank you, sir. Yes, Mr. Dollar. Thank you. Now, um, how would you two like to help me over onto that bed? Well, you know something? Sure, those two are even younger than they realize, but... I think maybe those kids will do all right. I hope so. Anyway, expense account total, including a doctor who came in to make sure that I was all in one piece. Hotel, mileage on the car, and uh, the trip back to Hartford. $229.57. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, the most clever device for covering up a murder I have ever seen. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Serrato Jr. Music supervision by Ethel Huber. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were Jim Z. Summers as Marilyn, Lawson Zerby as Sergeant Piper, Richard Holland as Alfie Brannigan, Herb Duncan as Tim Harrington, and Bill Lipton as the policeman. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Art Hanna speaking. The Peace Corps needs farm skills. Volunteer today. This is the CBS Radio Network. Hi, this is Andrew from otrwesterns.com. I wanted to invite you to come take a look at our site where we put out podcasts of old-time radio westerns. 
Check us out at otrwesterns.com. You're listening to The Great Detectives of Old Time Radio with Adam Graham. Now let's get back into the show. Welcome back. Wow, Johnny really told off that uh, sergeant. And I don't recall Johnny ever doing that with a policeman who wasn't uh, corrupt. But Johnny is sitting there speaking as just this experienced investigator who just reads that sergeant the riot act. And he's clear, I don't have a problem with working with police. I don't have a problem with the Knoxville police. I have a problem with you. So that was definitely a unique uh, approach for Johnny, who struggled but eventually did come under something resembling professional composure. I did kind of wonder about the husband's statement, because generally you can tell what a statement means by the tone of voice. So a repentant, I will do better, is generally going to be different from a defiant, I'm going to get even with you, which, you know, are the the uh, reality and the way they took it. Now, it's possible, I suppose, that he just flew off the handle, said something that he didn't mean, and then on reflection decided, no, she didn't do wrong, I did wrong, and just redefined the meaning of what he said in the courtroom to suit his new intent. Now, it's also possible to argue that the title kind of gave away the twist in the episode. But a lot of times these are very general titles and they can have multiple potential meanings. While you might think, well, you know, obviously Johnny got the wrong idea about the husband. Well, Johnny could have gotten the wrong idea about the sergeant who, despite his uh, laziness, may have had this really, really uh, clever plan that he uh, pulled off and surprised Johnny. So I don't think the title spoils this one. All right, well, listener comments and feedback now. Bill uh, writes in, Hi, Adam, to your point about women being used to voice boys in old-time radio, it's still being used in animation today, the most famous being Nancy Cartwright, who is the voice of Bart Sampson. Uh, well, thanks so much, Bill. Yeah, I know that that had been done and, you know, been done in modern television. I just hadn't uh, heard it being done on yours truly, Johnny Dollar, until that episode. And of course, there's really good reason for doing that because, particularly if you're going to have ongoing series, because if you have, you know, little boys voicing boy characters, you know, you not only have the complications of, you know, working around the various state regulations of having minors working. But uh, when the boy, you know, grows up, the voice is going to change. And uh, if you're not prepared to age the character sufficiently, uh, that's not going to work out well for you. Dan uh, comments, I love Johnny Dollar. Is Perry Mason something you might add? I love Perry Mason, too. I know he's a lawyer, he, but uh, Paul Drake is a detective. Well, thanks so much, Dan. Um Having the main character be a lawyer is not really a deal breaker for me. Uh, I've done Defense Attorney, uh, The Amazing Mr. Malone, and A Life in Your Hands, created by Earl Stanley Gardner as well. At this point, it's not something I would consider, because while there are more than 300 episodes of Perry Mason out there, none of them form an actual complete story because Perry Mason during the uh, golden age of radio was a soap opera and they actually string together a lot of consecutive episodes and a listener uh, actually emailed me uh, because somebody asked about this, I think, you know, several months back. And uh, he said that he listened to all the files on the disc and there was no uh, consecutive story. You know, you might have, you know, 75 straight episodes, but it doesn't come to, you know, a climax in a case. And so I'm not going to, you know, take, you know, nine months and play, you know, Perry Mason and say, well, that is the final episode of that. We have no idea how this resolves, but I hope you've enjoyed this, uh, Perry Mason. 
Now, if there were a complete storyline, it's something that I would consider. I'd take a listen to the quality of the adaptation, and then I guess one thing is just because the storylines are so long. I mean, if I learn, well, good news, uh, we found all but four missing episodes in the middle of this 196-episode story, that would take a really long time to get through, particularly if I did what I normally do with 15-minute shows and just do two episodes a week. But certainly, if there ever is a complete Perry Mason storyline out there, I'll happily take a listen to it and consider uh, when and how to run it. So thanks so much for the question, Dan. All right, well, that will do it for now. Join us back here tomorrow for Dragnet. Next Friday, another episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember to order your Great Detectives of Old Time Radio t-shirt at t-shirt.greatdetectives.net. But in the meantime, uh, from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.